Good afternoon and welcome to Agri-Food Conversations brought to you by iSelect Fund, the Van Frem Report, the Yield Lab Institute and Family Farms Group. My name is Tom Bond, a principal on the iSelect Fund Ventures team, and I'm excited to welcome you all to our discussion today. Agri-Food Conversations is all about driving innovation in agriculture. Each month we highlight a specific theme and this month's theme is agroforestry. On today's call, we are joined by Kyle Gertridge, head of business development and partnerships at Salo Sciences. Salo Sciences guides investments in natural climate solutions by leveraging satellite data, ecological modeling, and artificial intelligence. It works with stakeholders to identify priority areas for conservation, uses high resolution remote sensing and AI to comprehensively track ecosystem health at low cost over large areas and supports conservation planning by reducing uncertainty. Each of you knows companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We've invited you to this call because you are some of the smartest, most talented people in Salo's market. You are potential customers for their products and services. You've built a similar company or a unique, or you have a unique expertise and or understand the challenges and opportunities that Salo Sciences may face. A few process comments before we start. We are not soliciting investment in any way whatsoever. Secondly, you can use the Q&A box to ask a question at any time, and we will answer as many questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for replay. So with that, I am pleased to introduce Kyle Gertrude, Head of Business Development and Partnerships at Salo Sciences. Thanks for joining us today, Kyle. Yeah, thanks for having me, Thomas. Um, and to everybody else, thanks for joining. Um, actually kind of near and dear to my heart um, set of topics and, and, and attendees here. I'm headed out uh, after this talk to my in-laws uh, aquaculture farm in uh, beautiful Central Valley of California here um, to do a visit. So um, yeah, familiar. I'll jump right in here to a short introduction about um, my company, Salo Sciences, and kind of our key product offering, which is the Forest Observatory and its various applications. Um, Sala Sciences is a remote sensing focused technology company uh, whose expertise lies at the intersection of ecological modeling, um, especially with respect to forests and forest ecology um, and other woody biomass, remote sensing technology, and particularly uh, airborne LIDAR and satellite um, data collections, uh, um, as well as um, data science and computer science with respect to machine learning, deep learning, and artificial intelligence algorithms. Um, we kind of combine all of these different focus areas to produce a set of fund fundamental ecological variables, specifically focused on forests at the moment, um, including all of these different variables that you see on the screen here. So uh, three dimensional metrics of forest structure and composition, including height, cover, uh, base heights, densities, uh, and even understory uh, uh, metrics such as ladder fuels and surface fuels, um, and also health metrics like mortality and stress level um, uh, for a number of different use cases. Uh, the Forest Observatory is uh, produces data at the 10 and 3 meter resolution, so nearly individual tree level. Um, so compared to kind of traditional vegetation mapping systems, somewhere between 10 and 100 times the resolution um, and much more accurate when compared to legacy data sets like the US Forest Service land fire data set, which is um, at the 30 meter resolution. Um, it's also current and updatable as often as monthly um, at, at enormous scale. Um, whereas land fire and LIDAR, um, airborne LIDAR data collections typically are hard to do on a kind of regular frequent cadence. Um, we can either fill gaps between those collections um, or just produce kind of ongoing monitoring on, on, a, on a frequent time scale. Um, because it's all satellite based, um, this, this data is derived directly from satellite imagery. Uh, we can produce huge data sets over a continent scale um, and, and across various ecosystems um, with great consistency, having it all being derived from the same data production pipelines um, rather than kind of consensus ground-based uh, uh, data production system. Um, and I'll get into kind of some of the applications of this after some visual examples. Uh, this is the US Forest Service 
This is land fire data set for forest structure. This is their um, data for tree heights visualized uh, in the central Sierras at a 30 meter resolution. Um, and this is the data that we're producing at a three meter resolution. Um, clearly much higher resolution, much more detailed, uh, but you're also picking up things that aren't present in the Forest Service data set, um, including a very large burn scar kind of directly across the middle of the landscape, more detail in the commercial timber operations on the eastern side and on the western side, more detail in the um, developed area in the Wui there. Um, so in terms of understanding forest uh, uh, structure and composition, uh, we're giving significantly more detailed insights uh, for a number of purposes, including a fuels reduction, um, understanding the impacts of wildfire and tracking um, uh, and monitoring commercial timber harvest activity and, and regrowth. Uh, here's just an example of the tree height data set uh, across the entire uh, Central Sierra to give a sense of the scale of these data sets. Um, currently, we're producing data in Oregon, Washington, and California, uh, and the rest of the Western US will follow in the next couple of months and we'll have entire lower 48 and potentially North American coverage um, sometime near the end of the year. <clears throat> uh, one of the key applications of this data is in wildfire modeling. Um, so you can take all of those, all, the, all of those data sets we showed are inputs to kind of your standard uh, raw thermal based uh, wildfire spread model, the same models used by the Forest Service and CAL FIRE, um, but with much better data inputs. Uh, to produce one kind of predictions of wildfire spread and then annualizing those um, simulating millions and millions of fires over the course of a theoretical year, you can produce really um, fine resolution, highly accurate maps of wildfire risk. Um, so what wildfire risk to structures, developed areas, but also to wildlands um, and, and com commercial timber applications. Um, we, uh, currently use last year's uh, hourly weather data um, and our own proprietary fuels data to run these simulations. Um, and another application of this data is to estimate above ground biomass and forest carbon. Um, this is kind of where we're seeing the most interest recently um, and where we're focusing a lot of our development efforts. So this is another um, example in the Central Sierras of uh, an area that's had some timber activity and some replanting and, and regrowth. Um, and we are quantifying above ground carbon at three meter resolution um, using planet, planet scope imagery. Uh, and over two time steps, you can quantify and visualize the difference in carbon sequestration and loss since 2016 and 2020 in this area. Um, we are serving this data through uh, a, a partnership with a company called Upstream Tech, um, utilizing their Lens uh, landscape monitoring platform. It's this great front end, a, a web-based front end tool that allows you to upload different site boundaries and locations and import a bunch of different data sources, including commercial and uh, uh, freely publicly available satellite imagery and indices, as well as our own um, forest data, um, such as canopy height, cover, above ground carbon, and also tree count um, algorithms to quantify some of these metrics across um, your own properties. So particularly useful for reforestation and afforestation based forest carbon projects, um, and also applicable to improve forest management uh, use cases as well. Um, be happy to provide um, a live demo on this uh, to anybody that's interested as well. This has um, just now gone live in the last uh, month or so. Um, some other use cases of forest observatory data. Um, we talked about the modeling wildfire use case using um, our fuels data to improve the uh, realism and accuracy and currency of um, input data sets to wildfire spread models. Um, you can also use the high resolution height and cover data to do defensible space monitoring. Um, uh, by cross-referencing building footprints and buffer zones with uh, those kind of spatially explicit height and cover data sets. 
um, as well as wildfire hazard mitigation planning. So um, identifying areas of high wildfire hazard and then using the fuels data to evaluate where um, you know, high, high impact fuels reduction or forest restoration projects um, might have the highest impact in reducing um, high wildfire hazard areas, both by reducing fuel loads for spread rate and intensity. So being able to do that analysis. Um, we can also do uh, analysis of burn severity um, post-fire to get a sense of potential ecological impacts, um, including risk for mudslide and the opportunity um, for replanning and, and, and for, for planning those operations. That's the north complex there. Um, and we also have a system that does individual tree level harvest monitoring. So this can detect basically anywhere in the United States harvest of individual trees over two time steps, um, both in clear cuts, uh, which are fairly easy to do, um, but it works equally well in selective harvest applications. Um, and then another uh, use case here, maybe slightly less uh, applicable to this group, um, but using some of the height and cover data to cross-reference with uh, utility asset locations, um, to get a sense of densities of potential strike trees, um, one for fire risk and also just for, for, for asset risk. Um, so more of kind of a large scale public use, um, but this could be applicable to other types of equipment and hardware as well. Um, yeah, and with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Thomas for question and answer. Thanks for walking us through what you're up to, Kyle. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we now have some time for some Q&A. The best way to, to ask a question, you have a couple options. You can go down to the Q&A uh, icon at the bottom of your Zoom app and type in a question there. It looks like we've already had one taker. Or you can raise your hand um, on the right side of your screen and the participants, um, or actually that's also at the bottom of your screen. I see it on the right of, right of my screen. Um, and if you raise your hand, we can unmute you and you can ask Kyle a question directly. Uh, but it looks like we have a couple coming in already. Uh, Dr. Istvan uh, from Hungary uh, asks, can you discriminate plant species by multi or hyperspectral data? And I'm on mute. Um, yeah, so species detection is certainly the holy grail of ecological remote sensing uh, science. And we haven't cracked the nut yet, although we do have the ability to do kind of rough species grouping within forests. So distinguishing between um, you know, conifers and uh, uh, deciduous trees, even doing kind of like some rough species grouping as in pines versus firs versus, um, uh, versus elms versus uh, other types of kind of easily identifiable and groupable species. So, we are working on it, um, but it is one of the harder problems here um, and expect to see more progress on that in kind of the two year time frame. Awesome. Um, the same uh, person asks, is there an algorithm for phytoplankton mass determination? Um, not in our system. Um, we typically don't focus on, on, on blue carbon if that's what the question is getting at, but um, when we do our carbon uh, uh, carbon allometry, we're using our structure metrics, such as height and cover and density, and um, rolling those up using species mix assumptions for the specific geography to arrive at our uh, carbon and biomass estimates. Awesome. Uh, a couple of questions I have, Kyle, on kind of go to market um, and kind of the business side. What's what is, I guess, how would you lump your uh, primary customers? Um, is it mostly municipalities? Is it mostly uh, logging companies? Uh, what's kind of the percentage breakdown of your customer base? Yeah, so kind of three different verticals that we focus on. One is um, large scale land management and vegetation management, and the commercial customers there are generally um, major utilities doing. Uh, vegetation management on their assets. Um, we also have engagements with state agencies in California um, to uh, do both fire mitigation and fuel load analysis, as well as defensible space analysis. Um, on the 
wildfire risk side, we typically partner with risk analytics firms that do kind of property-based risk analytics for in insurers and real estate developers. Um, and we provide our fuels and hazards, hazard data into them um, to provide to their end customers. And then on the carbon side, um, we, we uh, provide the kind of turnkey lens carbon monitoring and evaluation uh, tool directly to uh, funders and purchasers and operators of large forest carbon offset projects. Got it. And is the is the satellite data is that uh, is that a public data set? Is, on the first slide you had is the forest observatory. Is that is that your data set or that, is that a public data set? Yeah, the, the forest observatory is the technology that kind of underpins our application. So it's okay. the, it's our data production pipeline um, that ingests satellite imagery and then um, produces forest structure metrics. Um, we use a mix of uh, government and publicly available uh, uh, satellite data like Landsat and Sentinel-1 and 2 um, and JEDI. Uh, and we also use commercial satellite imagery providers like Planet. And who do you find yourself going up against um, other other players using publicly available data sets with their own, you know, you know, um, algorithms on, on overlaid on top of that? Who are some of your major competitors? Yeah, um, in the utility space, we probably have the most competitors. Um, Overstory, Live EO, and AI Dash all kind of have purpose-built end-to-end solutions for vegetation management in the utility space. Um, Whereas we are just producing the data, we're, we're very focused on producing the highest quality, most scalable, updatable data. Um, and so those are our three main competitors there. On the fire risk space, there really isn't an alternative fuels data set other than land fire, which is free and publicly available and produced by kind of a government academic consortium. Um, but it's fairly low quality. It's never it was never meant to do pixel-based wildfire spread simulations. And there a giant disclaimer on it that says so, but it's the only thing available. Um, so in that sense, we're competing with kind of a low quality free data set, um, but are pretty distinguished from that. And then in the carbon space, there's a number of kind of new companies. Um, Solvera comes to mind, Pachama, <clears throat> NCX, um, who are producing kind of remote sensing technology for evaluating uh, forest carbon. Uh, is that kind of your fastest growing segment on the carbon side or? Uh, I imagine there's, I know there's a lot of hype around that space now, but uh, curious what, how you think it will shake out over the next uh, couple of years in terms of uh, percentage of, of your business? Yeah, definitely the fastest growing, um, especially in the last six months. Uh, it, there's a lot of interest in people who are funding uh, and overseeing reforestation projects, either for marketable offsets or for um, kind of softer claims, right? Just planting trees to plant trees and benefit the environment, um, but without trying to market a credit. Uh, and right now, the only context they have on the performance of all these projects, which are generally for the larger funders, global in nature, are, you know, reports back from your point of contact on the ground, whoever's kind of like running the project in Kenya or Paraguay. Um, and there's no way to kind of summarily uh, monitor and quantify progress. Um, so there's a ton of interest in this. There's, you know, millions and millions of hectares globally being um planted for reforestation and carbon purposes. Um, and this system is kind of perfectly positioned to do that monitoring and also kind of like pre-investment site assessment, um, you know, uh, right out of the gate. So we think that that will grow really quickly in the next year. Um, the big growth opportunity there is um, if the major carbon registries like Vera and Gold Standard and ACR and CAR um, will, uh, transition to adopting um, or allowing remote sensing data in their monitoring, reporting, and verification protocols, which they currently don't. It all has to be ground-based, and it's a big bottleneck um, in terms of getting more forest carbon projects approved and uh, more offsets onto the market. So they're all working actively on this problem, um, and our plan is to kind of develop uh, in, in parallel with those efforts. Are any of the national parks or state parks interested in, in that just for their own kind of marketing purposes or is, is, is it mostly more on the, the private side at this point? Um, mostly on the private side uh, for, for carbon, um, although state parks and also conservancies um, across the West Coast have been using our data for various kind of monitoring and quantification purposes. 
Um, we recently did a project with uh, the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative, quantifying um, and locating the, the largest stands of largest trees um, to kind of start, start to do some stratification of uh, conservation potential. Um, and there's a lot of, kind of similar use cases to that out there in the in the um, public and, and nonprofit world. Awesome, super interesting. Thanks. Um, well, Kyle, I like to, to, we like to end these by asking how can this audience uh, interested in agroforestry, uh, how, can, how can they help you? How can they get in touch with you? Um, and uh, yeah, how, how can they help? Yeah, so we're, um, this, this uh, Carbon MRV product is brand new. Um, it's really kind of a natural marriage of our um, kind of current off the shelf forest monitoring platform and this lens um, front end that's produced by Upstream. Um, but we haven't put a ton of work into hearing from people in agroforestry who are interested in carbon kind of exactly what metrics and at what cadences they need insights on. Um, so hearing from the community about um, what needs to be measured, uh, how and where, um, and for what purposes is, is really valuable. Um, and if anybody is interested in monitoring um, and, 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 and reporting uh, tools and data for um, reforestation, afforestation, uh, uh, and other carbon projects, we'd love to hear from you and, and, and show you um, what the tool can do and, and, and hear from you where the shortcomings are. Um, I'd say that's probably the primary way. Um, the other is if there's interest from the ag community on un better understanding wildfire risk, um, you know, potentially for vineyards or for commercial timber um, or other um, other ag properties that are uh, you know wildland adjacent, um, we we we'd love to hear whether or not uh, better insights on um, you know, current year wildfire hazard are interesting. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Kyle, for joining us today. And congratulations on Salo's progress um, to date. Uh, also, like to thank the audience for your participation. As a reminder, we host these calls every Thursday at 3 p.m. Central. Um, if you want to share this with a friend, we welcome you to do so. Um, and a replay will be emailed to, to you in the next 24 hours. Um, and new viewers can register for these by going to agrifoodconversations.com. And if you'd like to learn more about agroforestry, join us next week when we will be joined by Elizabeth Hunter, COO and co-founder of TreeSwift, uh, which is building uh, the next generation of forest monitoring systems used in carbon capture estimation, timber value estimation, deforestation monitoring, advanced growth forecasting, and forest management. Um, so hope to see you next week. And again, Kyle, thank you very much for your time with us today. You're welcome and enjoy the Tree Swift folks. We just talked to them uh, this week. Great team. Fantastic. Looking forward to it. Thanks, everybody.